Pretty. All right. Hello, everybody. We're back again uh, with two of my favorite human beings in the whole entire world. And I know I've said this before, but both Liz and Catherine are like family for me. This has been one of the greatest, greatest side effects of The Great Awakening is finding people that you feel like you've known your whole life, um, but you literally just met because of the shenanigans and the shit show we're all living through right now but i'm so excited today first of all i want to say a very happy belated birthday to liz she had on march 28th right she had her 28th birthday oh she's got her baby boy there um so happy 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 birthday liz um and uh you are you 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 are such an incredible human being and i'm so happy to call you my friend so happy birthday to you and today we're going to be talking about something that liz is really good at doing and this is the power of words and the energetic response of words and i say that because both catherine and i have on liz's shirts she does too <laughs> and as you guys know i pretty much live in liz's shirts and as we've said before yep there we go as we said before her i mean so powerful your designs have so many incredible messages and the one thing i've said this before and i'll say it again the one thing i love about liz's merchandise now we see a lot of merchandise regarding this battle that we're in but it's very political right it'll be very political uh blue or, or blue or red but with liz you you kind of leveled it up and you're like no no it's not about blue or red it's about the spiritual awakening that we're all going through right now and your shirts talk about that so therefore it's not polarizing it's like these are concepts and words and powerful words that we all need to really think about and meditate on and that's the beauty of your 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 shop now liz uh you're in a beautiful state of tennessee that is talk about nature catherine have you yeah. ever been to tennessee no i haven't been my mum's been to tennessee to see the horses and things so um uh, yeah. i haven't been to tennessee yet so uh, tennessee yeah. and kentucky if you drive yeah. through the rolling yeah. mountains it's, it's so yeah it is it is breathtakingly gorgeous um the nature yeah. that exists and that's what's so interesting like they they tell us all these things about like the human population and all that. i'll be careful about what i say and how many of us there are but if you drive through the United States, there's so much land. There's so yeah. much beautiful land um, that it's yeah. it's um, it makes you question what what's really yeah. going on. So much available. Yeah, people also make fun of the roads over here because they're so winding. Like they say that they basically just follow the cow pass and made roads. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You haven't seen anything until you look at the English country roads. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I've been on a few of those. They are pretty much, <laughs> they are very similar. Yeah, I mean, our roads where we live and everything, you can just get one car down and it wouldn't be a big American car, a normal sized car. And then, then you get mad people like me leading three horses along with it and everything and blocking the way. So, yeah, we, we Brits are very much used to the windy country lanes, very, very much so. So, down here in the yeah. sun. We get stuck behind tractors a lot in the south. If you get stuck in a small town, you'll be stuck behind this tractor. Yeah. You'll see a lot of cars like trying to pass, trying to get around this tractor. So, um, yeah, yeah, tractors and school buses. Tractors and school buses for sure, for sure. But uh, anyway, but it looks beautiful up there in Tennessee, Liz. We had a crazy yeah. thunderstorm last night here in Georgia, but look at that beautiful blue sky. And that green grass. Yeah, it's perfect today. It was it was like that yesterday over here. Is they were you know threatening for storms and nothing really happened. And then today it's beautiful. Yeah, got an amazing pink tree back there. I don't know if you could see it, but it's gorgeous. That's the one thing about the alive. Yeah, it's so beautiful, isn't it? When you get out into the country and and look at all these, the the, the sky is so blue. The green grass is so green. Um, yeah, I don't know if you see. There's a bunch of uh, violet. In our in our yard, I made some tea out of it the other day. Super good. Oh wow! Look at you! Look at you being all crafty. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> Using the natural resources. 
It yes, really exactly. Good, actually. Exactly. I've got so much growing in my garden that we use, you know, just about everything for the animals and the horses. So we've got a pledge in our garden that anything that we've put in since we've been living here has got a use that you can use, not just for ornamental value. And we really do do that. But it gets a few yeah. giggles when you get people come round and say, what are you growing all those nettles for? <laughs> yeah, my sister does the same. She picks stinging nettle over there. And, you know, apparently it's good for allergies and all that kind of stuff. And so she just much made, like, stuff. a little tincture out of it. Yeah, more vitamin C and stinging nettles than virtually anything else. It's very high in iron, vitamin C, all sorts of vitamins and minerals. So good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things they, they told us it's all weeds, <laughs> and it's not. Well, it, isn't it some parts of the United States, I don't know how it is in the United Kingdom, with your, with your yard, with your, your property, you can't actually... You can grow some things, but they're, they actually, the government steps in and, and kind of monitors sometimes what yeah. you're actually, which is crazy. I always, I always That's like crazy. applaud Florida because Florida has become the MVP of the world, really yeah. of the world. Right. Um, and I know in Florida, they, they take up a, a, a land ownership so seriously. Like if you own a plot of land, if you want to go mow your lawn, butt ass naked and let your, yeah. your bits just hang and swing in the wind. No one can do anything <laughs> because you're on your property. Yeah. So even what does MVP? I mean, you said Florida's the what? The, the most the MVP, the most valuable player. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Florida, Florida. We dispute it. I think we think it's hysterical elsewhere in the world that the Americans always think it's somewhere in America. So we can have a giggle about that. Well, it's uh, <laughs> we're just, uh, with the whole like. Um, I mean, I laugh because Florida was the state in America that everyone made fun of, like for a long time. Yeah. Yes. And now, joke. what have what? What now everybody wants to live there because DeSantis has yeah. basically been like, we're going to follow the Constitution. Um, the the cold, the, the sickness, it, it's gone. It's, we're done. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they just, they're very much into following. And that's why, I, that's why I laugh because before this, we used to make fun of Florida. Like there's a joke where you can type in your, your date of birth and put Florida man and see what crazy charges someone were charged with in florida on your date of birth but but literally like at this point that's why i laugh and say it's the mvp because no one ever thought florida and now everyone's trying to move to florida because it's, it's funny but is it don't you find it funny ladies i know we're digressing a bit but don't you find it funny that even with all we've gone through over the last two years that people are all moving to places like florida because you've got someone like DeSantis in at the moment but we all know that could change at the drop of the hat and then yeah. what is people going to do, move again? And I'm really hoping that we're getting to the stage that rather than us having to move to gain our sovereignty back, we'll gain our sovereignty back where we are now. We are. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, too. People keep saying, because I know this happened to Texas as well. A lot of people from California moved to Texas. And people, are, the, the people that are from these states are like, that's great. You can move here, but don't bring your bad ideas to our state. Yeah. You voted that the way. Same here in Tennessee. Yeah. Over and over and over again, you voted this way. And that's why your state fell apart. Don't bring those bad ideas here. If you're going to come here, right. You can't do to our state what you did to your state. So that's the big, that's the big concern. And I know here in Atlanta, like we, uh, um, we've gotten a lot of people moving down from New York down here as well, because Georgia obviously in a lot of ways is like Florida, not, not as free, yeah. but, but people are coming down here. And um, I mean, it, my sister and her husband sold their house about a year ago um, and they sold their house. They had it, it needed a lot of work, but the property was in so demand. I, they sold it for like over a hundred thousand asking price because people were desperately moving down here and trying to find homes because they're trying to get out of New York, which was lucky for my sister. Yep. But for people that live in Georgia who don't make the same salary as someone in New York City, it gets a little bit hard for the residents to then buy houses it's it's it is kind of crazy what's what's happening and what's uh how it's gonna like shake itself out you know um and that's well, interesting had a big yeah. move in the uk with you know people moving out of london and moving into the countryside all over so the house prices have absolutely shot up there because people have decided they just don't want to be living in big cities anymore 
um, you know, too much control over them. Whereas people who are living in the middle of the countryside, like I am, they, they can't control you because we've got no police anyway. So, <laughs> you know, you're, everyone's so spread out in the middle of nowhere. You can control people when they're all lumped together, can't you? But when they're all spread out, it's much more, much, much more difficult to do so. And we don't have any street lights. You can't put cameras anywhere. There's no way to monitor you because there's, there's none of the infrastructure in place. So it's fantastic. Speaking of monitoring, do you know what I, what I saw this morning when I was flipping through uh, social media? And who knows if this is true or not? But if it is true, I'm horrified. Now, here in the United States, I'm sure it's this way in any um, Western country as well. When you go to the bathroom in like a public restroom, um, sometimes they have like an automatic flusher. Where like you see it at the airport a lot. And if you look at the toilets that have automatic flushers, they have this like black screen looking thing on the back of it that's supposed to censor you to see when to flush. Well, somebody posted that those are actually cameras. How hard? I've always wondered that. Oh my gosh. I don't know if that's true or not, but how horrifying. Like, who's the sicko that's watching that? That's the last thing I would yeah. want to watch. Seriously. That's a very <laughs> bad angle. Yes, yeah. it's a very bad angle. But but speaking of care, I saw this where you mentioned that, Catherine. I was like, oh my God, I just saw something about this that people are going, wait a minute. What are these sensors? And is that a, like, is that a camera? Like, are they watching us go to the bathroom? Are they what? I mean, yeah, it's a bad angle because for women, you're just seeing a rump sit down for men. It's just, you know, you don't have to look through the cameras uh, in the bathroom to see the men. You just go to Florida and see the men just swing their lawns, swing and Richards, low in, row in their lawns, you know, their lawns, you know, so, yeah. so yes, but yeah, I do. I have noticed that because I know like when I was coming out of university, it, uh, most people from my class um, even had to go to a city to find work. They kind of made it that way where people had to go into cities mm. to actually start their career. There were a lot of like smaller towns that could not um, give a life to people because of the jobs they had picked. Now, what's interesting, Catherine, because I've noticed that too, with this whole situation that happened globally, we'll just call it the shenanigans that happened globally. A lot of people are trying to get out of cities now because I think people did notice, you know, it's one thing like here in, in Atlanta, I live right smack dab in the middle of the city. And I'm sure I know it's the same way in London as well. It's the same way in New York. Uh, you're living on top of each other. You're yeah. literally living on top of each other. But when you actually have land, when you have property out, out in the country that's yours, then you have something worth fighting for. You know, whereas in a city, it's like I always cracked me up when people would buy like um, condominiums here in Atlanta, like on a sky rise. They're literally buying. It was weird to me because they'd be like buying a piece of air, basically, because it's not on a like you're buying a piece of like air in the sky. Like it's 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 on the same lot as like 100 other people like this is weird to me. But when you're in the country and you have your land and you have mm -hmm. your house it's yours. And so that, that again, get, gives you something worth fighting for. And I think people are starting to realize the importance of having their own space and having God, God gave us land for a reason, you know, and having their own property and their own sovereignty. It's sovereignty to have that. Yeah. I mean, um, the, one of the selling points for this house was, I mean, it's only like half an acre, but that's a lot for this area. Um, and I mean, like you were saying, so many people from big cities are moving here that our house value has gone up over like two to three hundred thousand dollars in three years, like insanity. And then they're building places like that that are right on top of each other across the street. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh my goodness, you're ruining this, <laughs> you're ruining the country for us. Like, you know, we love having this big space that we can just do whatever we want and because exactly what you said it's like freedom of sorts <laughs> um, sure. i'd love to have an even bigger spot but you know um yeah it's it's definitely freeing when you've got actual land that i can pick the flowers and eat them if i want to <laughs> i can grow my own food you know i can let my child run around barefoot and do what he wants you know no one's watching us yeah it just makes such a difference. Yeah. Well, it's like even here in a city, I mean, I don't have kids, but I have a dog. I cannot let Robbie has to be on a leash. He has to be like, he can't just run around unless we take him to the dog park. He can't just run around. He has to be like controlled. 
But yet when I'm like at my parents' house or at some property, we can let him off and just let him roam and, and be free and how happy he is just to be, just to be free. And I think it's the same with children. Tell me when I was a little kid, we, I don't know if our parents knew where we were in the afternoons, you know, we just roamed around the neighborhood. Mm. Mm. So talk us through, I heard you on your channel, Liz, um, talking through your tree design of your clothes. Now, for me, one of the things I love, and I think Bryce and I have spoken about this before, is when you're wearing something that you really resonate, because obviously all words have energy, and when you're wearing it, like I've got my Born for a Time Like This sweatshirt on, which I absolutely love, but it sort of reinforces that message into you. Is that part of the reason why you decided to put some of these things on clothing? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I feel like it's, you know, it's one thing to just wear something that, you know, you like, and you think is cute, and you think looks good on you. But it's another to have something that deeply resonates with you and has a deeper meaning. Um, and it's a way to essentially express myself and my thoughts and my beliefs without being so overbearing and blunt about it. Um, because a lot of my shirts, almost really all of them, except for maybe this one, <laughs> it's Charlie Ward one. <laughs> um, they are very like non-political. They're very, um, you know, open to interpretation. And I wanted to create something that, you know, someone could resonate with, but resonate in their own way. And not just say like, you know, like I've said before, I could have easily could have so easily um, just put Mr. T-shirts out there, <laughs> but I didn't. Um, I wanted to express my truth and help others do the same. Um, so that's kind of the, a lot of the reasoning behind a lot of the designs that I have, like being able to say something without really 100% saying it because it can be open to interpretation. Yeah. Well, even your, it's all a pantomime shirt. Um, I was, uh, we were talking about sticks on Aquarius Rising Africa the other day. It sticks as in uh, the veil between the um, mythology, between the spiritual world and our world. They, they called it sticks. It was a river that divided. It's spelled the same way as the band sticks, right? And it reminded me of their song, The Grand Illusion. And I actually went and listened to it again this morning to, mm -hmm. to listen to their words. And they're saying, so it's like, it's all a pantomime. Like, this is all a grand illusion. So even yeah. with that shirt, it's, it, it's, I know that Charlie's referring to what's happening in our world right now, but really the deeper you go down this rabbit hole, you realize that everything is all a pantomime. Everything's a grand right. illusion. Everything is, is, and that's your shirt here. I'm constantly, or I'm endlessly creating my reality. You know, we are but yeah. holograms of what we need to learn. And um, there, something very strange happened to me once when I was, uh, this was a few years ago, I was driving, I was more than a few years ago, I was going through like heartache. Um, and it was and I was and I was really in the, the just the depths of, of that sorrow and that grief of um, the heartbreak. And I was driving. And of course, this was the heat. Obviously, it's for 15 years, I've been in this practice every day of trying to like, understand my own soul versus the nature of the soul and i was and all of a sudden i had this like almost out of body experience where i realized that none of this was really real anyway it was all a projection of what i needed to learn and i was sitting in my car i got like giggly about it and i was like wow like i don't need to be in this heart this is also my own and then it, then i quickly came back down to being in heartache again but it's like when we when we think about those those moments of of clarity about who we are as spiritual beings in a human experience, we need to have these human experiences. Of course, Catherine and I have talked about this, but it is this pantomime, it is this grand illusion, it is this this place for us to to know to to create something to then know to then come back and know ourselves. Does that make sense? For sure. Yeah. I um <laughs> There's so many times when, like, like you said, like there's been um, situations that have been really painful that I just kind of like step outside myself and I'm like, what does this even matter? <laughs> like the grand scheme of things, like, you know, this is like a mere speck in my journey and then, you know, the universe, <laughs> like, you know, I need to learn from it, whatever I need to learn from it and move on, like continue on, you know, um, I mean, in a, in a sad, very you know, weird way. It was like, that was how it was when I had um, a miscarriage. I was like devastated, obviously. But at the same time, I ended up coming out of it so much more powerful. And it kind of like became the slingshot for mm -hmm. me to like propel myself into, 
this place of empowerment and I don't have to be sad about this all the time. I can be sad in the moment, but I can move, I can move forward. I can move past it and I can be stronger for myself and my family and the child I do have. So it's kind of exactly what you're talking about. You know, pain has a funny way of <laughs> being very powerful and launching you into something even greater, I think. Yeah, it's the more your heart breaks, the more the light can come in. Yeah, <laughs> or the, uh, the crusty, I think of it as like a, you know, there's like clay over it. The more it breaks, the like real true heart that actually is beating um, can come through, you know, that's alive can come through. So interesting. I've told this, said this story before because in my uh, lineage of yoga, the practice is, is really painful. It's, it's, a, it's an extreme physical exercise it's not fun to put your legs behind your head it's not fun to catch your ankles in yeah. a back bend it creates a physical sensation you have to work through and david Grieg, one of my original teachers asked guruji once um guruji is is the pain in this pra practice necessary and guruji said yes because pain is real pain brings you to a point of of honesty of vulnerability you know, it brings you to a point of, of, um, of humility as well. And I think uh, wisdom is gained from pain. It's like your empathy when you, when you, if we take something like a broken heart, which all of us go through as humans, it gives you an understanding and a, and a depth an in-depth look at what that is. And so when somebody else is experiencing, it's like that wisdom grows deeper of understanding what it truly means to be human, what it truly means to experience. And I think a lot of times, um, one of my pet peeves recently is, People who are new to the spiritual path think that it's just leapfrogging into bliss. But most of that spiritual path is actually being able to process um, pain, whether that's abandonment, whether that's shame, whether that's guilt, whatever that is, um, in order to use that then to allow yourself to grow more depth of understanding yourself. And, um, and I know, Catherine, we were talking about this earlier, and I've talked about this with Stephanie. I think a lot of people, too, are really confusing spirituality with things like divination divination is not spirituality it's just a form of communication it's just like picking up your cell phone and texting like me texting Catherine. that's not spirituality that's just communication spirituality true spirituality is coming into the humanness of you using your human experience for what it's meant to be which is that that lesson of you to learn and grow your soul and it's and it's not it has nothing to do with anybody else it has nothing to do with any other spirits. It has nothing to do with any other human being. It's about you and your own growth and your own journey. Yeah, I feel like it's like kind of just, to, you know, it's just coming back to yourself, you know, and, and accepting yourself fully in every moment because there's so many times when we don't. Um, and there's so many. You found a dinosaur. There's so many times when, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of my journey, I feel like, has just been, like, full acceptance of myself. Um, and I, <laughs> I didn't think that that was, like, the plumb line point, but it just kind of seems like that's all, like, that is a reoccurring theme in my spiritual growth. Yeah. I think it's such a good point, Liz, because, you know, we talk about through all of this is at the end of the day, all we can really inf influence is ourselves and how we react and how we contribute and how what energetically we add to this world that we're living in at the moment. And yes, of course, you know, with, with work, with community, whatever, you can contribute to others, but the level that you can contribute to other people is, is very much at the level that you've accepted yourself. So, for example, we know what it's like. I was having a conversation with someone yesterday, which was hysterical. And it's like when someone gives you an apology, but it's a but. You say they apologize and then it's a but. And it's like, is that really an apology? And it, that transforms, I think, into so many areas of life. If, if you're really giving in a community sense or really listening to someone else, it has to be leaving the buts behind and just being there and accepting it and not just always trying to get your own point across. It, it's a funny old world. And it does make me question sometimes how much time myself and other people and all the sort of conversations we have, we, we talk about all these deep, meaningful things, which is brilliant. And personally, I love it. But equally, you just want to get out in the garden as well. It's about balance, isn't it? There's balancing, yeah. the doing, the being, 
and the thinking, the headspace side of things. And that's always quite a journey, I think, for lots of people. Yeah. Yeah. I honestly, I get to the point where I'm like, I don't want to listen to anything else anymore. <laughs> like, I just want to be for a little bit. Like, that's kind of how it's been the past two weeks for me. I've had, um, I've had my birthday and everything. And it's been this very, like, zen time of, like, I don't need anything external being input into me right now. I just want to be <laughs> singing Baby Shark. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just want to, you know, just be here and really experience this time because I love this time of year. It's my birthday, it's spring, you know, and I just want to be outside. <laughs> and so I haven't, I haven't listened to anybody that I normally listen to. I've just kind of listened to music sometimes. That's about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, it is that ebb and flow. We were saying that exact same thing in our previous chat, weren't we, Bryce? Is saying that we're at a stage, and other times I'll be at a stage where I might feel I need something else, or I listen to lots of different things to see what resonates. And I think we're so lucky, aren't we, to have the choice of, of things at the moment. You know, regardless of what we think about all these different technologies and platforms, it doesn't half open up a lot of choice for us all. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that too. And this again is another concept coming from the traditional teachings of spirituality. And it's like, um, you, you see it a lot again with how I perceive this through my experience with Dashtanga Yoga is like, you, you'll go through phases where the teacher, you know, if you go to like a, a contemporary yoga class, the adjustments are nice and lovely. They like pet your shoulders, rub your back, not in traditional yoga. They're cranking you. It's a little crank. I mean, I used to say when I would be in down dog see, and I'd see my teacher's feet paddling over to me, the theme song of Jaws would like, dun, 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 like, like come in my head because I didn't know what was about to happen. But what happens is you would go through weeks and weeks and weeks of being like manhandled and cranked and things would be popping and moving. And then all of a sudden the teacher backs off and just lets you practice. Well, what's happening is there's integration. And so we do go through these phases of like learning, meditating, thinking, exploring, and then we just become human again and we don't think about it anymore. And what's happening is those patterns are starting to integrate throughout our psyche. And that's a beautiful thing to recognize because we, it's David Cohen was talking about this, like needing to take a break sometimes. That's important to recognize because that's your psyche, your, your consciousness saying, okay, let's pause here and let's let this filter through, you know, and that's so important. And then just turn on baby shark and dance around. You know, like that, yeah. that's what <laughs> yeah. you do, you know? <laughs> that's literally been my life for the past few weeks. But that, that's exactly like that, that just confirms something that I've always said. What you just said there was I always used to say, like, if I was getting frustrated with learning something or doing something new, I would like sit and like not do it for a few days and let it marinate is what I would say. Yeah. It's like I need to like let it marinate in my body. And then I can continue. And I always would do better the next time I tried to do that thing, like a few days later. Um, and I never knew that that was a, a thing. But yeah, it's in it, that for me. In RV, they call it cocooning. It's your cocooning phase. Mm. That makes yeah, a lot of sense. It's just lovely. And, and that's where I think it's so great. You know, the instant gratification society where everything's at your fingertips can have a lot of downsides. But also mm -hmm. it can allow people on the positive side for me is it can allow people to go through that integration, cocooning, um, taking all on board when it's right for them. Because even, you know, with us as friends, you know, we're, we're, we'll all go through different stages of wanting to um, go through that quiet page. And we can do that because we can then go back to it at a later date or come back in and have it reinforced. And I even find yeah. stuff I'm wearing – and, uh, you know, that's why I was so excited with Liz's stuff, because it, what I feel out of it, what I get out of something is something completely different every day, depending where we're at. So sometimes I put on my born for a time like this and I am ready to go out there and do battle. You know, it really motivates me into that energetic state. And other times, like today, born for a time like this, I was on before I spoke to you two, I was on this gorgeous gorgeous long dog walk with my son who's just come back and and a couple of the dogs and I was just like so grateful to be at this stage in my life where I've got the luxury of um you know mixing I don't have to go to a nine to five job I don't have to do this I've I've got to that stage in my life where all these new choices have opened up to myself so 
the same sentiment for me will be completely different each time I put it on. And what I find, Liz, is when I put on your shirts and uh, things, it really makes me step back and think about that. I mean, I'm on, I know some people don't like wearing things like that. For me, I'm the complete opposite because it's sort of all almost just reinforcing for myself and I find it really helpful. Absolutely. Yeah, I am. Um, I, 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 I'm really into fashion and I really just like for the look of things, I really like aesthetically pleasing things. Um, so with all of the designs, I didn't want to be screaming at anyone. Like I wanted it to just be very subtle. Um, and I think that's why people, you know, have liked them because, you know, you don't want, you know, just <laughs> like, I could have easily said something like, you know, I don't know, like one of the like coin terms that like we use in the truth or community about like, you know, free, like free breather, free thinker kind of thing. I could have easily said that, but I just didn't want to scream at people. And, um, and even the born for a time like this, like. I mean, it resonates with everybody because we are born for this time. Like we yeah. all are, no matter what side of the coin that you're on. Um, you know, a, a very like liberal person could wear that shirt and think something completely different. You know? Exactly. Um, but I just, I felt like it was way more inclusive that way. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so really glad that you did. I'm really glad that you get that out of your shirt because <laughs> um, yeah. I feel powerful, especially when I wear that one. It's very individual. And I love what you were saying about how you're making everything so inclusive because isn't that the world we're all trying to create? We're all trying to, right. you know, and it's so important. It's, it's actually much easier, I think, to be divisive than it is to truly yeah. be inclusive. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, I was talking to a friend that is very liberal um but we both are married to um okay baby shark um we're both married to Mozambicans we both have children we both have a small business so we have plenty of things to relate on and we were both talking how it's pretty lazy to not be able to relate to someone on some level like yeah. to not be able to have a conversation with someone just because they don't believe exactly what you believe it's pretty pretty lazy <laughs> And, you know, I was amazed that she even thought that, too, because, you know, she's on a totally different spectrum than me. <laughs> and, um, but, yeah, we were able to have, like, she came over to the house, and we had, like, a great weekend together, and we talked about nothing political, nothing going on in the world. We just, you know, connected as humans, as wives and as mothers, and, you know, it was great. And that's a new phenomenon. I know, Kevin, we've talked about this a lot. When I was a kid, and I'm a good 10 years older than Liz, but when I was a kid, you it, it was like normal for, for people, for friends, for married couples to have different opinions on things. It was not something that divided people. We're, at that point, I think we were, as, as humanity, we were more interested in our com commonalities and, and finding the differences intriguing versus something that completely separated us. And so I think that's a new thing where people have gotten into this phase of like, you have to believe exactly what I believe, or you just don't exist in my world. And I'm telling you, at 39 years old, I don't think there's one person in my life that agrees with absolutely everything I agree with. All through the phases, my 39-year-old self doesn't agree with my 29-year-old self or my 19-year-old self. And to be, that's the ebb and flow, right? We talked about that, that's the ebb and flow of it all, at all. And so it's beautiful when we can see people as just being human beings. Like none of us get out of this world alive. We're all in this here going doing the same thing. Oh, I so love that, YouTube, because, you know, I don't want to be in a world where politics is any part of my discussion, because I don't believe in politics, and I don't believe it's going to be part of moving forward. And in the UK, I was brought up, we used to have a saying that it's if you ever had a dinner party or friends over, the two subjects you never discussed were politics and religion. Mm -hmm. And the reason you didn't discuss it was not because you wanted to avoid confrontation, just because it was none of your business and everyone was entitled to have their own opinion and that didn't define them as a person. And I just think that was a really, really good rule because actually if you do avoid, you know, at the end of the day, those, those views will shift as the person shifts and grows and evolved. And like you said, Bryce, I mean, my 
54 year old self is very different to what my 20 year old self would be am i saying and and isn't that the whole point of growing how boring would it be if we didn't evolve like that and wouldn't it be lovely if it doesn't even occur to us to talk to our friends about politics because that's not a dominant feature in our lives and how the world is controlled I mean, that was for most of yeah. my life. Even when I would date a boy or meet a man and start dating him, I never would think to ask what political party they aligned with ever. Like that was never even a consideration. I just liked the guy for the guy. You know what I'm saying? So absolutely. And I will say too, speaking of words and uh, like using the words, and I have this shirt on again today, guys, that I cut myself, but this is the, I am endlessly creating my own reality from Liz's shop with the two hands and I'll have to tell you guys um and for the viewers watching so and I've talked about this with Shanti before that I have throughout my life I've struggled with like body morphic disorder where I'm really hard on myself and how my body looks and lately I have been doing something um new for me where I have been actually looking at myself in the mirror naked and telling myself look at that you have a six-pack look how sexy you are like really changing the way I talk to myself about myself and it kind of matches that t-shirt and it's actually working. Like I actually feel so much better in my body and I feel more confident. So messages, these words aren't just to be projected out to other people, but they're also a reflection into our own, our own mind field, you know? Yeah, that's definitely a thing. I notice the difference in myself when I say stuff like that. Um, it's, uh, you know, like very positive about myself. And, you know, I, I totally agree because I've been on the same journey of like body dysmorphia type of thing. I think most women in the South are. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, it is a super powerful thing. And then it's funny because I like, I'll do it for, I'm coming. <laughs> I think, come on. <laughs> um, it's funny because I'll do it for, you know, a few weeks and stuff and then I'll get used to it and I'll stop. And I'm like, why am I stopping? You know, it's like you kind of get used to the, the new thought pattern and everything. And then, you know, the, the, the challenge is to keep doing it, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm kind of yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's such a good message for everyone. And, and that's what I feel is, is it's the, the, the important message is the message to ourselves, isn't it? And I find it really interesting what other people like. Sometimes I say, what does this mean to you? And like we were saying about when you go on, a, when you're doing a book club with your friends or something, I think the beauty of it is everyone will see something different in it. And, you know, that does expand your consciousness because you want I mean, I certainly want I want to hear other people's point of views because I get bored with my own. <laughs> I, listen i've had some really bad ideas in the past so <laughs> uh, through most of my life i've had some really bad ideas so at this point wisdom is being able to sit back and listen it's like a uh, ganesh you know the 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 deity of ganesh from the hindu faith he has an elephant head because he has two big ears and one small mouth yeah i've heard you i've heard you say this before and i was like that would be a great t-shirt <laughs> yes <laughs> I need to do an elephant, but <laughs> yeah, an elephant with some kind of saying that implies that. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's 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 and one of my one of the most profound things someone ever said to me, or I read somewhere, I can't remember how I heard this, but it made a huge impact on me. Was when someone said, "Most of the time, people listen to respond, not to understand." Mm. Yeah, and we need to listen to understand. Yeah, so and I think that you know almost the whole point of our existence is to learn other people's perspectives. That's why there's so many of us, <laughs> um, you know, like we all have a completely different perspective. I mean, even in, you know, Christianity, they talk about the body of Christ, like the arm can't do what the leg does and the leg can't do what the eyeball does. You know, we all have different parts that we're working with. And uh, I think it's, the one of the most wise things that we can do to search out the different perspectives and just listen to people. Yeah, for sure. Well, and also the different environments we come from. I know Ram Dass wrote about this once that, and you see this a lot when people undertake spirituality, like all of a sudden you'll see like a white kid from Wisconsin will go to India, change their name and adapt to Hindu lifestyle. And Ram Dass was like, don't do that. 
you you incarnated into a white boy from Wisconsin because there's something to be learned from that experience. And when you ditch it and go and try to take on a new identity, you're escaping the experience that you need to learn from. And so if we're all trying to be this one particular way, then how are we going to learn from each other? You know, there's something the white kid from Wisconsin can teach the Indian in uh, Bangladesh or in a, um, not Bangladesh, in uh, Mumbai or something, or the African in Mozambique. They all have different perspectives on life because we're all living a life, but with different, uh, different experiences that have shaped our perspective on things. And my perspective as a white girl from Georgia is going to be very different from someone who grew up in Moscow. So I, I have something that I don't even know if I just say, you know, that I could teach that person and that person can teach me because of the experiences that we both decided to have in these, in these incarnations. And that's super valuable. I think also- yeah, that's actually something. Go ahead. No, sorry. Go ahead, Liz. I was just going to say that's something that even at the home group I go to, we were talking about this past Sunday was, you know, perfection is fully being yourself perfectly. Like it's not this cookie cutter perfection thing. Like we've been brainwashed to believe it's, it's individual for the person. What I was going to say is I think also though, being kind to yourself that part of that process of the white guy going to India and living into that lifestyle to me, I think is just like, you know, when my children were young, they used to put on a Superman outfit and change and the way they play very when they had the Superman outfit on was very different to the way they play when they had the little ballerina dress yeah. on. Yeah. And I think as adults, it's really important to let ourselves play with that as well, because yeah. Quite often, you will find out a lot about yourself by your mistakes. So sometimes, I mean, it's like me with my hair. I'm always having different things done and always looking for something that actually suits me. But actually, what am I learning in the process? I'm learning in the process just what you were talking about earlier, Bryce and Liz, is the fact that just accept yourself however you are, and it doesn't really matter what your hair's like. Yeah. So I think... All of these things for us, it's like you can laugh about it afterwards, can't you? Because you recognize it was a stage of your learning. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I find it quite amusing because I've been like when I used to be in my corporate, some of my corporate careers, when you put that suit on and you stand up at the meeting, you sort of adopt a different persona. And then you realize that's not you. That's just the role you're playing in that time and that place. And it's quite funny because you'll think, well, if only they could see what I'm really like at home. <laughs> well, yeah, so. and, that's the, and that's the whole, like, with the white guy going to India. I mean, go yeah. experience, go to the ashrams, go. But understand that it's, it's when, it, when you try to adapt to become something you're, you were not born to be is when there's an issue. Because, yes, absolutely, like... You know, I love, I mean, going to Hindu temples is one of my favorite things to do. And I, I go to them here in Atlanta because they're so peaceful and they're so quiet and you can just go and sit in silence for a little while. And, um, but yet, but yet understanding that I'm not, I was not born Hindu. I have yeah. to embrace the lessons I learned being born Presbyterian, um, yeah. being born in Georgia, or being born in South Carolina, growing up in Georgia. Like I have to embrace the experiences but then you can, you can go and you can put on the, go to the, the Mandir or go to the, the temple and, and take a piece of that perspective and bring integrate it into who you are as you, you know? And it's, um, it's such a beautiful thing. Like as kids, exactly when they're playing dress up and they're playing, uh, you know, even when you watch kids play together and they're playing pretend, you yes. know, it's, it's, um, it's interesting to see how they can morph into a different character altogether when they're playing pretend. But then when it's over, they can go back to being themselves, you know? It's kind of um, me and Johnny have decided, my husband have decided that, you know, there are things about his culture that we love and we want to implement in parenting Levi. And there are things from my culture that, you know, we want to keep and implant (laughs) or implement um, in teaching Levi. But like, you know, I'm not, I'm not over here trying to be a Mozambican mother, like yeah. not try it. Like I know I'm married to one and my child is half, but like, doesn't mean that I'm that <laughs> not yeah. at all. Well, look at Levi. Levi's only half. He's also half you. He's also has that half Tennessee 
white person heritage as well. That's also a beautiful part of him too. You know, I think sometimes what we do as humans, we, you know, we have that saying, the grass is greener on the other side. We always right. think somebody is way cooler than we are. But then someone looks at us and think, I mean, as, as Americans, Liz, I know when I lived in England for a while, I had half of the English people think I was super cool because I was an American and others hating me because I'm an American. But it's like, but there's so, so much beauty in every culture that you have a piece of that. And like, and again, for someone like Levi or any kid, I mean, I had a lot of friends growing up who had like one parent from the UK or one parent from Germany. I had a friend growing up whose mother was from the north of France. And I'll tell you a funny story. In his house growing up, they only spoke English. She never spoke French to them. So all throughout his childhood, he did not grow up speaking French. And then the summer between our ninth and 10th grade year, freshman and sophomore year of high school, his mother shipped him off to, um, I think they were in Brittany or Normandy, one of the northern areas of France, shipped him off to her parents' house where they didn't speak any English. And he spent the whole summer having to survive with his family. And he came back after that three months speaking fluent French. You know, and so, but you, but he had been raised because they were living in Georgia. They, they predominantly raised him and his siblings in a Southern, in, predominantly English household, you know? And so it's, and that's the beautiful thing about everybody is like, even if you think you, you have this mundane life, no, you don't. And you picked to be there. You picked to, to incarnate into that white guy from Wisconsin or that Indian kid from Mumbai or that kid from Mosin, that's you, you arranged that for yourself to have some sort of experience through that incarnation, through that, through that pantomime to, to circle back <laughs> to that pantomime. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> we, we, ain't, we ain't no circle back girls though. We ain't no, sir. That's a, Catherine, I don't know if you see a, a good Saki will say, we'll circle back to that a lot. And so there was, a yeah, I, yeah, I love it. Yeah. I'm just mesmerized by watching. I'm going on the walk with Liz at the moment. So if I look like I'm not concentrated, I am, but I'm just looking, just, it's really interesting. It, it, it looks, you know, very familiar. I love trees. I'm obsessed with trees. Look at this one. I love this tree. Beautiful. It's amazing. Beautiful. And it's such a time of renewed, isn't it, spring? It's just everything spring yeah. life again and renewing and coming out bigger and stronger and better. And, yeah, it's gorgeous. Well, we love your T-shirts, Liz. We really do. We love the fact that you're doing it. I love the fact that you're able to combine doing that whilst being, you know, a young mum to a, a young toddler as well. I think that's just absolutely gorgeous that you're able to combine the two as well. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm trying because, you know, I, the, uh, before I, I say I had my tower moment, <laughs> I was very much kind of a victim to being a mom and like didn't feel like I could do like anything. And I was just like, this is dumb. <laughs> like I, I can do whatever I want to do. Like, you know, I'll figure it out. It might take a little extra energy, but you know, I think it's important also for Levi to, you know, see his parents like, you know, chasing after their dreams and doing what they, you know, love to do. And, you know, hopefully that'll, you know, create something in him to go after what he wants, you know, and not just accept the everyday norm, normal life that they tell us that we need to have, like the American dream of nine to five and all that crap. So <laughs> I, uh, I just kind of hope to, inspire him and my future children to do the same as much as I can and others you know because I've I've seen so many moms just kind of feel really powerless and not feel like they can do anything and I'm like you can do whatever you want to do you just have to have a you know use a little extra energy <laughs> extra energy that you might not have you just got to find it from somewhere dig deep it's there <laughs> you know so I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate you, you both. You've been such a amazing support of my small business. Um, I'm not sure that it would have taken off as well as it has if I didn't have the support from you two and, you know, the other truthers and whatnot. So I'm really, really appreciative. Hey, it's easy to support your business when you have such great stuff. So, I mean, I'm serious. I, would, I, I literally, uh, people know I, I wear your shirts pretty much every day. Me too. Yeah. So, oh, okay. I mean, I love, I love them. So, so, and they're good quality. It's it. They're really wow. good quality shirts, and um, 
And that's the world we're walking into, right? Like, yeah, we're walking, we're all walking to their home. Like we're all each other's family. We're all each other's friends. We're all holding hands and pulling each other up. And um, it's interesting as you were talking about being a mom and now I'm not a mom, but I was thinking, God, I would love, love to listen to a round table of a bunch of women in this movement, like you and Catherine, who are moms and also trailblazers and to have to listen to that conversation about kind of breaking the stereotype what true like what true feminism is not the not the feminism they've given us but what true what that truly means so i mean if that's something y'all would be interested in doing later i would love to watch that because i don't have a kid yeah. <laughs> i just have a, I have sure. a four-legged little boy i have a four-legged yeah, little I boy love it. i love seeing you know what liz is doing you know i i I didn't have the technology when I and my children were Levi's name. But, you know, the beauty is, is this is what, you know, I get so excited about is we can talk about all the negative things about these things, but let's focus on the positive and the choices it gives us all. And yes, yes we can all have our EMF protection and things like that. But, you know, equally, it opens up a whole new world of choices. And um, I, for one, am really, really grateful for that. I'm really grateful that I'm sitting here. We can have a conversation with Liz and Liz can still be doing fun stuff with Levi whilst you're doing it. I just think... Uh, it's just absolutely brilliant yeah. and, you know he's, you've got he's having a great time <laughs> i know it's just wonderful and he's he'll be taking <laughs> in what mum's talking about and everything and that's really really important so thank you so much today i think we should let you go off and play being sharp <laughs> <laughs> yeah he, he finally stopped singing it <laughs> he's got flowers in his hands <laughs> He's got flowers in his hands now that they're occupying him oh <laughs> well give him a kiss for us <laughs> You want to say bye, Levi? Bye. Come here. Say bye-bye. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Oh, bye. so cute. He's, he's going to be a little heartbreaker one day. <laughs> I know. Okay. I'm, I'm mentally preparing. <laughs> <laughs> but he'll be good. I think because he's a good mama, he'll be really sweet to women. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. His, his dad is very... Uh, uh, <laughs> Johnny loves to tell me that, you know, he was chased by girls all of his life and he was just going, eh, whatever, <laughs> until I came around. <laughs> That's what I call confidence. And perhaps I have exactly the same cute reaction when I look at Ravi as well. So, you know, <laughs> I, I have a special spot for him because he's so cute. Yeah. So, thank you so much, ladies. Go and enjoy the sunshine. It is actually sunny here in the UK, but it's really cold. So, it listen. Yeah. Liz has even done long sleeves um, t shirts for us in the colder parts of the world. Thank you, Liz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.